Hi, thanks for your patience and, and waiting for us. Um, welcome to the Visions webinar. I'm your host, Molly Hurley Dupre. Um, and today we're excited um, to launch this webinar series with a great lineup of speakers um, that we're really pleased to introduce to you today. Um, but first, the title is Stronger Together, Why Networks of Energy Access Practitioners Matter. Today, we're going to welcome Jim Porcaro, Senior Director for Energy Access at the UN Foundation. Willington Ortiz Orozco from Visions, Dipti Vagela, coordinator of the Hydro Empowerment Network, Mariela Pino, co coordinator of Red Biolac, and Harihara Mahapatra, COO of the Clean Energy Access Network. So we're pleased you all could join us today. Um, and a few quick reminders before we get started. Um, we're going to start out with brief presentations from each speaker. Followed of our roles was to um, elevate this burgeoning sector in the global discourse. So those were those are the goals um, for the network um, and how we actually achieve those goals. Um, we do them through a number of ways. The first is by helping create market intelligence. Um, some of you may have participated or have seen uh, our, some of the market surveys that we do usually on an annual basis. Um, every year we choose a particular topic that we dive deep into. Um, our, a couple of years ago it was finance. This year's survey that we'll be publishing later this year will be on gender. So we try to create market intelligence by conducting our own surveys of the sector as well as participating and contributing to other market intelligence that's commissioned by uh, other organizations. We convene the sector through um, hosting high-level events, training workshops, networking events, and through our membership directory, which is on our website. Uh, we do a lot of uh, knowledge creation, um, particularly through webinars like these, uh, but also through our web uh, website, which serves as kind of a clearinghouse for best practices and data. We do a fair amount of uh, communicating of, of relevant sector news, resources, opportunities through things like our website and uh, newsletters. And then lastly, we, we promote and kind of advocate on behalf of the sector um, really as kind of a neutral uh, convener in this space, not necessarily representing any particular segment of the sector or industry. So those are some of the tools that we utilize to, to kind of further our goals. A little bit about who we represent and, and service. Um, over the years, as you can see, we kind of started out with 20 members back in 2011 and have grown uh, to roughly 2,500 individual members who in aggregate represent roughly 1,400 organizations around the world. Uh, you can see a little bit of a distribution around, you know, in terms of where our members lie. So, um, as you would expect, a pretty high concentration in Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, and parts of Latin America. Um, in terms of the types of members, um, we kind of always set out to be a network of the ecosystem. So we are not necessarily an industry organization only representing practitioners, although a good segment of our members are practitioners. Um, if you can actually read that little um, figure, you'll see that roughly a third of our members are SMEs, um, uh, quite a few social enterprises, international NGOs, local NGOs, but then we have large private businesses, development organizations, academia, civil society, donors, funders. So in, a, in an essence, we kind of represent the broad ecosystem uh, uh, for energy act for the energy access sector, if you will, and obviously there's too many kind of members um, to kind of uh, represent in this slide, but um, I would say a good majority of our members are involved in um, solar PV, whether it's kind of picos um, or um, solar home systems, including mini grids. But there are quite a few people who are also uh, involved in cooking, fuels. So again, a, a, a fair distribution in terms of our membership. So that's a little bit of a, a background about um, the Energy Access Practitioner Network. I think this last slide just kind of sums up some of the some of our work in in some bite-sized statistics in terms of 
what we've done over the years, I think in, in, in total, we've done about 40 webinars, reaching over 6,000 participants since 2013, uh, reaching around 7,000 recipients per month via our newsletters. But um, I'll kind of wrap it up with this, and I'll just conclude by just saying uh, something I should have mentioned earlier on, which was the Energy Access Practitioner Network was originally conceived of as, a, as our contribution to sustainable energy for all. Uh, which hopefully uh, many of you online are familiar with, but this started out as an initiative of the previous uh, Secretary General. And so we, we kind of established this network in support of, of SE for All, which over the years has now morphed into its own NGO that we continue to cooperate with. Um, and this network really serves as a way of kind of serving as a two-way channel to sustainable energy for all as well. And that kind of ties into what I was saying earlier around linking and advocating and promoting this sector to the larger, higher level um, development kind of agenda setting that um, sustainable energy for all is involved in. So I think I will conclude it with that. Thank you very much, Jim. Thanks. That's that's an excellent overview of kind of the lo the global type of network. Um, so next, we're going to um, speak to Dipti Vagela. So I will just send you a quick uh, request. Hi, Dipti. Welcome. Hello, Molly. Hi, great. So I can I can see your slides there, and I'll let you go straight into it. Sure. I'm Deep D. I coordinate the Hydro Empowerment Network, known as HPNet. We're a knowledge exchange and advocacy platform for small-scale hydro practitioners. Our mission has been to advance microhydro below one megawatt by synergizing practitioners across South and Southeast Asia. For some of you who may not have experienced microhydro yet, if you were to visit a well-executed project, you'd see that it involves various types of engineering, including civil, hydrological, mechanical, electrical, and electronics. You'd also see uh, a healthy watershed um, that's protected. Um, this is where the water source generating the electricity originates. And you'd see active members of the community who were facilitated by local practitioners to implement the project now operating it on their own. These practitioners um, were able to do their work with access to enabling financing. And so making good microhydro happen uh, requires multidisciplinary skills connecting technology, environment, people, and policy. And HPNet helps to do this. Uh, yeah, so in late 2013, uh, we started with 20 members from eight countries. We rapidly grew to 90 and 19 countries, not as rapid as, <laughs> as the UN Foundation Network. Um, our rapid growth stems, I think, from the shift that took place in how international development supported microhydro in the region. 30 years ago, microhydro was a vibrant part of the international development portfolio. Older practitioners often remind me that in the 1980s and 90s, there were frequent capacity building trainings to develop skills locally. There were regional publications and newsletters. All of this was done in parallel to providing great amounts of project funding. In fact, senior staff of major donors then well knew the technology having been practitioners themselves at some point. However, 30 years, uh, later, the scene now is very different. Um, our members struggle in finding capacity building activities, in project funding that can sustain their teams long term, in creating a voice for microhydro at the national policy level, and even simply convincing uh, leaders of donor programs to understand the factual advantages of doing microhydro, uh, which is the least cost renewable energy technologies. Um, it has components that can be built locally, and therefore there's extensive job creation, local skills building, and it produces 24 seven reliable electricity at capacities and costs that allow for social, um, socioeconomic end uses. And so despite these advantages, the sector doesn't receive the attention it needs to survive. 
And, and so this is where HPNet comes in. How do we work? First, we align our work based on practitioner priorities. We have an all member gathering every one to two years. Um, it's facilitated in a way that invites open and productive dialogue on how to create change at the ground level. The process concludes by prioritizing working groups for that year. Uh, you can see some of our current groups here. These groups are supported by a secretariat, providing coordination and strategies uh, for knowledge exchange and advocacy, which involves a four-step approach. We start with collecting and cataloging all available resources for the, the specific topic or issue. We conduct ground truthing to identify uh, the real-time practitioners and solutions. We then use this information to design in-person exchanges um, that eventually evolve into strategic support and follow-up. Our activities focus on four levels of outcomes, targeting impact at the community level. Uh, firstly, we want to see that practitioners who work directly with communities are, are, are connected in country and that they have an established unified voice for the sector. We do this via technical training and supporting local associations and centers to advance. Uh, secondly, we want to create an awareness among non-implementing multi-stakeholders in country, um, including civil society, local banks, government. And we do this by hosting practice to policy gatherings and partnership development. And thirdly, we, we build the awareness of international stakeholders who can influence in-country decision makers, resources and policies. Uh, we do this with advocacy activities such as webinars, um, and also uh, ensuring that local practitioners are included in decision-making dialogue, especially when it comes to SE for All approaches. And in addition to working with these three different levels internally, we, we connect them to practitioners uh, who work directly with communities, and we connect them to each other with the overall aim to develop a strategic coalition that brings change. And uh, we do this by coordinating field visits, action research, and also um, facilitating very uh, strategic multi-stakeholder dialogue. And so what have been some of our impacts? Just to give you some glimpses, uh, here there's Lewis on the bottom right. He's, um, he makes um, Tony Bung, uh, Create is, is one of our members. He is the main, the master laveman there. And he was super inspired to go to Sri Lanka at a training where Rohita, who's, who actually taught me microhydro ages ago, um, uh, to basically when I met Lewis, he said, I stayed in the sector because of that training. It totally motivated me uh, to continue doing and innovating our design. In the middle, you see um, a, a training for ELC for electronic load controllers at the prestigious HICOM in Indonesia. And so these were, this is an example of how our technical trainings lead to uh, some impact on the ground. And then in Myanmar, we've been um, able to bring um, advocacy that was unheard of. Um, their local practitioners that, um, that were just invisible to the actors there. So since 2014, our first event there, uh, we've, we've been able to bring more of our members who, who represent decision makers or work for decision making organizations. And um, here's a picture where last month, our um, local bank that we've been bringing up to speed actually visited the local developers project. And we hope that by next month, we have a local bank financing these practitioners. Um, in Northeast India, I our, wanna say um, thank you, Dipti. I think we will, can we get into some more of your examples in the questions in the oh, discussion? Sure. Yeah. No, that's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for sharing that. I think it gives everybody a little bit of a taste of what we're going to dive into in the panel discussion or a bit more of the examples and the kinds of, you know, outcomes uh, networks can really have. So thank you for that, Dipti. All right. And next up, we have Mariela. So Mariela, um, I'm just going to bring your slides up here. Welcome. Can you hear me? 
Yes, I can hear you, Molly. Thank you very much for the invitation and organizing this interesting um, webinar. So, I, I am, my name is Mariela Pino. I am the general coordinator of the Latin American Biogas Network, which started in 2009. Um, it started by, by the gathering of uh, professionals that back then were also working in isolated countries, uh, different experiences. And as Jem Pokaro mentioned, it was necessary that everybody was uh, reinventing the wheel, right? So since then, um, we have gone through already uh, the redefinition of our strategic um, interest and work. So I'm now going to mention you to mention to you the latest uh, ideas we have. Uh, what's our working framework? And and so. Our vision is to, to actually become and, and to be the reference organization in the research, the development and implementation together with dissemination of biodigesters in order to simulate the proper management of natural resources and to promote the socioeconomic well-being of Latin America and the Caribbean. Our mission then is to, to be a network that brings together institutions related to applied research and the fusion of anaerobic digestion to stimulate integral treatment and management of organic waste as strategies to improve the well being of the population of Latin America and the Caribbean. We realized um, there are a lot of streams of waste, and we can uh, put a value on that, make it energy. And you know, already through the interactions of the people now at the webinar, how important that it is. So our strategic areas of work are research, development, and knowledge exchange, education as well, or capacity building, monitoring and evaluation of the technology and developing some standards and guidelines in relation to that, uh, the communication of the experiences and the, and the projects we have uh, within Latin America. And last but not least, we, we, we would like to push more and, and be more active into advocacy and public policy. Our values are what makes a difference and what gather, gathers us in, into a big network, uh, which it's pretty much involved into environmental awareness, social justice, knowledge exchange, collaboration and teamwork, innovation and accountability as well. Um, we, I am representing here a board, uh, which is compounded by six people at the moment. These six people are working in public institutions, in companies um, and also in institutions that are developing the sector of biogas in Latin America. These six people are from different countries within the region. Uh, I, I, I don't have the time now to introduce you to them, but um, you can see it on our website. And so all of us uh, are really working towards the accomplishment of the objectives in relation to the exchange of the information, uh, the failures and the, and, the, um, and the success of the different projects and the different experiences that people are uh, bringing up when they implement projects, when they develop research at universities, universities for instance, but also companies that are willing to develop and to contribute to um, um, develop and improve uh, the technology to make it easy to use, to make it understandable, and so on. So uh, we also try to identify and overcome those technical, environmental, social, and economic barriers, and to try to bring people together. Uh, so uh, demand and offer. You know, we we bridge organizations that help uh, to overcome some barriers. We have also. Um, since then developed some um, documents and, and magazines where we can um, translate the, the, um, the experience and the knowledge we have gathered so far. So we have generated some alliances to facilitate uh, all of those objectives. We keep on systematizing research um, and, and lessons learned uh, after 10 years of work so far. We promote the incorporation of more organizations and key partners within the region that we have managed that so far. And so we want to now go for a step further, which is uh, influ in, uh, influencing the, um, the policy making different countries. 
So our big achievements are so far uh, breaching these diverse institutions and being the only Latin American network um, at the scale of domestic biogas and productive biogas. We see productive biogas as a tool for bringing uh, energy independence, to bring in competitiveness for small and, and medium scale companies, and also to decrease the environmental footprints of our industries. But also we are very much interested in the um, urban scales and the peri-urban uh, actions of the of the human being. And so we are now pretty much committed also in, in introducing the um, um, municipal solid waste, for instance, into our discussions and our 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 working, our sorry, our workshops. Um, our important achievements also are related to bringing together students that are looking for uh, spaces and organizations to to develop their theses, their internships, and so on. So we think in the future. We know that new new and young generations have a very different approach towards environment. And we have uh, uh, developed an advocated time to help them to find the, the means to work there uh, by, by bringing them to our, our aims with our values and so on. We, we know that those professionals in the future will be uh, the seats that will bring more people and also bigger standards and better methodologies to implement the the biogas technology um, at domestic scales, but also productive scales. So the challenges are to contribute to disseminate the technology uh, at the moment, uh, money and investment in, in it, it's uh, a little bit scarce. And we this is a challenge we have so far. Uh, it's sometimes, it is sometimes difficult to maintain the momentum through remote collaboration. You know, Latin America, it's a very big region and um, resources are also limited. So we cannot, um, We most of our work, it's done remotely. So this is a big challenge. We have a big challenge now uh, related to measure the impact we have uh, managed along these 10 years. We, we, we know uh, within our language and within our activities, but we need to have like, um, like a timeline uh, showing and showcasing those impact and benefits. We want now to also keep the sub-regions active and, and have more uh, relate, uh, more specific working groups, as well as covering all the topics that we have uh, in our, within our objectives, including uh, incidents and policymaking um, influence. influence. So thank you very much, uh, Molly. This was my presentation, and I'm now available for for questions along the oh, webinar. Thank you very, thank you very much, Mariela. Thank you for that that overview of, of all of the work that you're doing for biogas in Latin America. Um, so I'd just like to remind the audience quickly um, to please send in your questions. I'm seeing a few coming through already, um, and uh, we'd love to hear from you, and we'd love to know um, what your thoughts are on networks. Have you found them to be valuable? Um, and uh, with that in mind, um, we're going to go to our next speaker, which is um, Harihara Mahapatra from the network CLEAN. Hi, Harihara. Are you there on the line? Hello. I think I can hear you now. Are you there? Okay, wonderful. So I've got your presentation up here, and um, please welcome. And we're we're interested to learn more about about your network. So, Clean uh, is the clean energy access network in India, which was uh, started in 2014. Oh, sorry, sorry, Harihara. Could you please move a little closer to your microphone? Um, whether that's maybe embedded in your computer, just get a little closer, because um, we can't hear you. Audible? I think that's a little bit better. If you can get even a little closer, it'll be even better. But thank you, thank you. Okay. Um, so Clean uh, was established in 2014 uh, as a uh, practitioner's voice forum. So basically in 2013, a lot of practitioners 
um, feels that the voice of the practitioners are fragmented. Lot of work is happening in different location and different geography in India, but their voice is not uh, actually met at the policy making level, and even their work is not getting disseminated at uh, you know different geographies and globally. So, uh, with a mandate of uh, building an ecosystem for the decentralized uh, energy practitioners in India, uh, some of the practitioners came together to form this association or network. Uh, and, and the primary uh, agenda was uh, policy advocacy and uh, engagement with government. Additionally, we also thought of uh, you know, facilitating fund flow to the practitioners as well as supporting skill gap uh, and, and technological innovation. So, so basically, this is a this is a technology agnostic uh, network which uh, is represented by different models, different uh, organizations with scale, size, geography. You know different philosophy. So basically, this is a network of uh, different kind of practitioners at one forum. Right? So, so before coming to this um, uh, network, the belief system was that around 400 million households in India are deprived of energy, out of which around 64 percent, um, uh, you know, the population, 64 percent population of India is depending on uh, traditional cooking fuel, and around uh, 15 percent of uh, the practice. Now, the potential of uh, Indian renewable energy is only tapped. So there is a vast gap, and therefore to meet that gap, uh, the, the network came into being in 2014. So right now we have around 115 member members in India uh, representing solar, biomass, uh, wind, hydro, and you know different other technologies. Uh, and and our focus area has been um, uh, you know primarily to to do ad policy advocacy where we felt that um, you know. Stronger ties are required to be um, you know, fostered with policymakers, and and our members need to represent at the highest level for decision making. So this is this is one of the top focus area. Which, you know, I'll request Moli to go to the next slide. Uh, and the and the, the second work uh, that envisaged um, with Clean was access to finance. Uh, so. So the idea was, uh, you know, a robust information channel for both investors as well as practitioners is required so that funding is mobilized. So, so awareness regarding our practitioners' work and you know, on the the potential that is there in India and and the impact that it creates. So all of this needs to be actually disseminated to the funders so that uh, there is enhanced fund flow. And there is a third vertical of work that uh, Clean focuses is on the you know, skill side, uh, where we we understand that the skilling of the sector is required. A lot of human resource, uh, you know, technical, uh, competent human resource is required. So basically, mapping of the need, training need of the sector, and then skilling of the sector uh, is something that we envisage. As well as um, we wanted to build the capacity of our own entrepreneurs, our member entrepreneurs. So that they can, uh, you know, develop uh, appropriate proposals, go to the bankers, and you know, get funding, and also scale their business. Uh, the next bit of work is on around the technology and innovation, where you know we wanted to develop universal technical standards for all our members. Uh, you know, doing adoption of uh, appropriate technological products, standards, and testing processes. So other than that, uh, the fifth vertical, which actually holds all of this together, is our information and networking bit, where uh, we provide different forums for our entrepreneurs to come and discuss important policy issues and you know, standards-related issues, and and also share experiences and knowledge with each other and talk to the policymakers. So so these are the five verticals that um, Clean is uh, presently focusing on um, in in, uh, in building building the sector in India. Now, uh, going to the next slide, Moli. So, some of our uh, accomplishments till date is, uh, you know, we, we could reasonably uh, succeed in building an ecosystem in India um, where the role and contribution of uh, decentralized renewable energy is recognized among these policy makers. Uh, so, the examples are like uh, we could contribute to uh, drafting of the national uh, mini grid policy, we were uh, part of uh, this uh, um, national energy policy being drafted recently, and uh, 
also contributed to the rates and uh, slabs in the recently launched uh, you know, goods and services tax in India. Uh, so these are some of the policy policy making um, you know, efforts that uh, Clean Clean could take up. Um, we are presently uh, contributing in uh, driving a policy narrative uh, around energy access because uh, in India the the focus right now is uh, ex ex expansion of grid grid energy, the centralized grid energy, and we are uh, you know kind of focusing on shifting that narrative from uh, centralized grid approach towards a complementing role for uh, DRE. Approach. So this is something we are uh, trying in the in the policy arena. Uh, from there, the other other achievements are on the, in the access to finance side. Um, we could uh, uh, we could conduct a debt uh, finance uh, study, you know, understanding different challenges that the sector is facing in uh, accessing financial support from banks, whether it is debt, whether it is equity or grant, and um, you know, collect a data from our members and uh, you know. We also started launching a state of the sector report, in which we want to uh, have it as a signature uh, you know, document for, for the sector, which anyone can refer to. Uh, also developed a tool for the uh, you know, DRE entrepreneurs uh, to understand the state of affairs. So, so this is a this is a very interesting tool wherein you know any of these entrepreneurs can key in their own information into the tool and understand where they stand. Uh, similarly, you know, a banker or a funding agency can actually use this this information to assess where these uh, institutions stand and what are the gaps and where to improve their, their quality, uh, so that it becomes a credit worthy institution. Uh, so these are some of the um, accomplishments in access to finance. Uh, following from there, we also did a lot of technological innovations and technology transfer uh, related work. Um, basically, uh, we are contributing to sectoral level tech, you know, technology innovations work and you know, piloting a lot of prototype uh, uh, products and appliances uh, and, and those products which, are, which can be actually scaled up and that can reach to the last mile uh, energy delivery and energy access uh, to people. And subsequently, we also did a lot of uh, skill related work, um, a lot of trainings have been uh, conducted. Um, on, on, on hydro, you know, biomass, on solar technicians, on mini grid. So a lot of uh, skill trainings have been imparted uh, both on technical side as well as on the techno managerial side and entrepreneurial side. Um, we have also been conducting uh, regular networking and policy events. The idea behind that is um, these events are actually um, opportunities where our practitioners can come together and share their experiences. Uh, talk to each other, meet with the policy makers, meet with the funders. Uh, so basically, these are networking events and policy events uh, that we, uh, we, we uh, keep conducting, uh, both regionally as well uh, as well as at the national level. Uh, two of our flagship events are also happening year on year. One is the India Green Cooking Forum, as well as one uh, called India Energy Access Summit. So one of the summit is uh, the India Energy Access, uh, Access Summit is scheduled uh, next month in February 12th and 13th in Delhi, and I will come all of you to attend. Uh, thank you, so very, thank you very much, Hari Hara. Sorry to interrupt, but we may need to move into our um, we may need to move into our panel discussion if that's okay. Yeah, yeah, I'm through. I'm through. This is the last slide, and I'm through. And thank you. So Oh, perfect. Thank, thank you so much. I mean, it's very clear from listening to all of these presentations how much is going on within the network. So I really appreciate all the panelists. Um, you know, we try to keep it short on the slides, but we're going to expand more now in the panel discussion. Um, but first, we want to do a poll of the audience. So let's um, get you guys back involved and, um, and share some of your thoughts. So we want to hear your opinion now. Um, so this poll is about what's the most important benefit of energy access networks? Um, select one of these below. I know it's kind of hard to choose, <laughs> especially um, because they're all so important. But to you, what is one that is the most important benefit of energy access networks? Capacity building and sharing knowledge and experience, a positive impact on local, regional, or global policy, access to finance or funding, um, the development or accreditation of technology, um, positive impact on communities and local stakeholders. So try hard, uh, select just one. I see a few people are still voting um, and we wanna hear from all of you. So um, get you guys back involved in here so that uh, 
you know, you're not just sitting there listening to us talk, but we also want to hear what you think. And that relates as well. I see we have more questions coming in. So please uh, keep sending in your questions. We want to hear from you. And we want to take up some of your questions in addition to the ones that we're going to address in the panel discussion in just a minute. Okay, so I'm going to share this poll with you. Let me go ahead and close it. Um, any last votes? Okay, so I'm going to close it now and share it with everybody. Um, okay, so the most important benefit, it seems people feel pretty clear that networks um, are most important for capacity building and sharing knowledge and experience. Um, but in addition, the positive impact that they have on policy, the positive impact on communities and local stakeholders, and a little bit on access to finance and funding. And we didn't have any votes for the development or accreditation of technology, but I know uh, that Harihara from Clean is going to take this up um, in a question in a little bit. So let me um, next, uh, share the screen. So we're going to do something a little different. Um, so during our panel discussion, I'm going to share the screen of, um, of Willington. And Willington from Visions um, is actually going to be taking notes live as we're talking today. Um, let me go ahead and close that poll and then we can see his screen. Um, and let's see. There we go. Perfect. So Willington, if you want to, you can come off of mute for just one minute. Um, <laughs> oh, he's already ready. Okay, brilliant, brilliant. So what we'll do then in that case is go ahead and launch into the panel discussion. Um, and with our first question, um, I'm going to pose our first question to Jim Porcaro, if that's fine, Jim. Um, let's see. All right. Hi, Jim. Hi. Hi. Well, great. Thank you. I mean, you, you've been able to hear... We've been able to hear about your network. We've been able to hear about several other networks around the globe. So I want to kind of launch into this um, panel discussion so that we can delve into a lot of what we probably wanted to say but didn't quite have time for in the presentations. Um, so my first question to you is, in your presentation, um, we heard about the aims and all of the progress and growth of the Energy Access Practitioners Network. And I want to ask you a question, might be a little difficult, but if you had to set up the network again, what is the one thing you would definitely do or not do? Hmm. It is a difficult question. Um, it is a difficult question, although, you know, I think over the, over the number of years that we've been operating, we've learned, um, uh, uh, or I, I would say we've taken note of some interesting trends. I think in many ways we have grown up with the sector. And so some of the underlying issues and challenges um, that served as the rationale for the, establish of the, as the establishment of the network six, seven years ago are have changed um, over those years. And I think one of the big things that we focused on initially was um, being kind of this generalized advocate for the sector, especially at a time where there weren't that many organizations around the world. Um, but over the years, the sector has evolved, grown, and matured in many ways, and, I, and we're beginning to see a lot more specialization within the sector, and a kind of the center of gravity, if you will, of the access kind of agenda has, in my opinion, moved from kind of generalized global advocacy to much more country-specific implementation. So if we were to do it again, I'm, I'm not sure... Uh, I think one of the things that we would pay particular attention to is trying to facilitate greater country level networks or at least network related activities or specific related activities to countries because I think that's where the center of gravity is moving. It's moving away from these kind of, uh, you know, global advocacy. We now have sustainable development goal seven we already have a lot of buy-in into this topic. It's really about how to implement on the ground. And that's why it's really encouraging to see some of these um, country level, uh, or at least sector specific networks represented on this webinar, because I think they really are the ones driving a lot of the action and coordination and knowledge sharing um, at, the, at the level where the action is. Not to say that the the, the you know the, the energy access practitioner network isn't serving a function, but I think 
we are definitely seeing an evolution within the sector that's uh, necessitating a lot more sector specific and country specific uh, network related activities. Mm, thank you. Thanks so much, Jim. And I think, um, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'll, Oh, sorry. I should have mentioned this. And I, that's partly actually why I, I, it was in one of my slides. But one of the things that we did over the last six, seven years, we actually helped incubate a, a, a couple of country specific national affiliates of the practitioner network. Um, and in fact, clean. Um, I, I'm kind of proud to say that the Energy Access Practitioner Network and the UN Foundation were kind of one of the co-founders of CLEAN. And I think CLEAN is a really great example of a success, you know, a great success story in terms of, of moving kind of from the global to the national. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, I think that's that's going to be very interesting to hear what people are having to say about the local level. Um, and for sure, we will definitely talk to you, um, Harihara Mahapatra, um, in just a few minutes to learn a little bit more about CLEAN and what they're accomplishing. Um, so next up, um, my next question is for Dipti. Hi, Dipti. Are you there on the line? Hi, Dipti. Sorry, that was me who muted you. <laughs> I'll take responsibility for that. <laughs> um, so, Dipti, um, this actually kind of follows from what Jim was just saying, um, because, you know, you have such a strong focus, you and HPNet and all your members, you have a strong focus on local community efforts around renewable energy. Can you give us a little bit of insight into the role of local associations and local practitioners in this bigger picture of energy access? Sure. So. Uh, accelerating energy access, one of the obstacles to do that is is to customize solutions. Um, you know, the main grid, you can, there there hasn't, uh, there is sort of a, a critical mass around it because uh, it's all the same anywhere you go. But for energy access with decentralized renewable energy, you, you have to customize for that community, for that context, for those stakeholders. And this is where partnerships between local actors and external ac actors become really significant. Um, the local practitioners are the ones that have experiential knowledge that's been iter iterated over time and refined and proven. And, um, and so for external actors who want to support um, energy access targets, they I mean, the, it would be a smart thing to to learn from what what has been done and then build on that. And um, and so we we're seeing that um, collaborative efforts really really are coming um, are bringing the impact. Recently, for example, in Nepal, just last week, Nepal um, interconnected its first micro hydro to the main grid. Um, within the policy it had developed in 2014. Nepal has had uh, 20, 30 years of international development support to do microhydro work, but bringing it to this last um, innovation and sustainability aspect of grid interconnection was all done by the local practitioners who had been um, empowered through those 20, 30 years. Uh, so, I mean, it's just one example. HPNet had a small role to play there, and we're we're really um, glad to have played that role. Where when we hosted a 2016 uh, practice to policy exchange in Sri Lanka, bringing Nepal and seven other countries to Sri Lanka to see their progress on grid interconnection, and they were inspired to see that Sri Lankan policymakers, utilities, government had made it happen on their own, and soon after they they built momentum to put their policy into action. Yeah, Thank and so uh, yeah, oh, no. is one, yeah, just one last note is that local associations are really ideal vehicles for external actors to work with practitioners uh, that have been on the ground. Uh, they provide structure, you can do it efficiently instead of working with a practitioner one at a time, you can do it as a group and, and really, uh, bring together the sector. 
Absolutely. Well, thank you. I mean, thank you for that kind of insight into the, the, the local element and also how you as a network, you know, you're very modest about what you guys do, but you as a network help to expose them to what's going on in other countries. So that kind of brings in that regional element and how to connect up the local with the, with the regional. Um, okay. Thank you very much, Dipti. So we will go to our next speaker. Um, that will be um, Mariela. So, Mariella, can I bring you off of mute here? Hi, Mariella. Hello. Yes, Molly, Hello. I'm here. Hey, wonderful, wonderful. So, you know, I want to ask you a little bit more about Red Biolac, right? Because we know you're, you're doing a lot of work on biogas, and especially this is for cooking and productive uses of energy. Because um, we're talking a lot about networks today, but we, we, we keep in sight as well what is the ultimate goal of that network. Um, so you've been working quite a lot on that. Can you, can you give an example of how your network has helped to make an impact in this area of cooking and the productive uses of energy? Yeah, sure. Well, first of all, uh, I guess for everybody, it's quite clear how biogas can be used for cooking, but the productive uh, biogas concept, it's something probably it's just uh, a known language we use within the network. And this is um, actually, um post uh as a as a term trying to help uh the people that it's not on the domestic scale neither uh at industrial scales that are pretty big and supported by by big investment funds and so on so we are trying to address all the people in between the small and medium enterprises uh at, at the region uh, just to let you uh, feel uh, an example, uh, a farmer in Honduras, which has um, uh, chicken production, uh, which it's about uh, 200 uh, chickens, um, mother chickens, so to say, uh, growing up uh, meat for local industry. That uh, animal manure, um, it's used by those uh, small and medium enterprises uh, into a biogas plant and that biogas plant um, produces enough biogas for heating up or warming up water which is used for the productivity process they have within their chain you know that you have to defeather the 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 chickens and so um you can introduce your own fuel uh, into the, your production decreasing the expenses you have monthly to running your business at the, and at the same time, replacing uh, fossil fuels. So you you help uh, the profitable levels and the competitiveness of those companies, but also the prestige they have within the, the local um, countries. I mean, one company uh, diminishing their ecological footprint compared to another one might not be seen uh, at the beginning uh, as a very uh, sustainable thing or, or something that it's not at the beginning of the interest of the clients. But lately, and along the, the 10 years we are now working at Red Biolac, at least within Latin America and even at, at rural areas, it's pretty much seen as a benefit and, and at the, as the companies that are going to uh, keep on running in the future, you know, uh, consumers are pretty much and more and more aware of the sustainability things not polluting not uh, uh, polluting water but also not air and so on and 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 working in a better way so um, by building capacity for instance uh, by developing guidelines and standards to on how to adapt those machines to replace fossil fuels by teaching how to measure the ecological footprint, you can show and demonstrate the impact you, those companies are, are, are having. Um, by, for instance, organizing in-person training when uh, the, our working groups are mostly uh, working in two and, and sometimes in two countries. So those experiences are shown locally to people interested in those things to le learn by by seeing and by doing but also the people that it's um in other corners of latin america are able to have access to those documents to those guidelines to those standards that are going to help them to understand the technology in a better way to monitor to measure and to improve their efficiencies and so on by learning from others experiences you know we we do not only 
exchange good experiences and lessons learned and, and trainings, but also the, the bad experiences, you know, because it's not just about the technology. There are many things that you have to understand when you want to implement a successful project. You have to learn how to cope with municipalities, with people that it's not aware of uh, the technology and what it needs, you know, so it's, it's a whole uh, software that it's not always so evident. So since we are uh, in this field pretty much in depth, we, we know that this knowledge is key when you, you, you face your first experience. So we help people to, to feel familiar, uh, to understand the technology. Uh, you, you can um, get to the people to understand that you can cook in a clean way by not polluting your lungs, by not putting at risk your children. Uh, at the domestic scales, biogas can be used uh, to replace uh, wood fuel, even animal uh, manure or dry dung. Even though within Latin America, it's not so wi uh, wide used, uh, you still have uh, a lot of people cooking on biomass, which is pretty much polluting. It's also affecting deforestation and so on. So when you show, to a woman and to and to young parents, the benefits of having clean energy to have um, safe and regular uh, availability of that fuel, and when you put these people um, with with the right people, with, you know, with the people that ha will have the patient, but will also be talking honestly about the technology because biogas it's very different to solar, and it's something that needs a lot of um, maintenance and, 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 and enough knowledge to keep it working, you, you make people to decrease their expectations and to avoid to have frustrations and so on. So we, we are very, pretty much happy and proud to, to take this uh, work on our responsibility because you also have to show the, the difficulties, the, 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 the difficult, I mean, things you will face. Uh, and also, um, I would say uh, connecting um, people within different countries because within Latin America you have different contexts, we have different climates, uh, we, you have countries that have more poultry production, other ones, other countries that have more pig production and so on. But the network, it's quite happy um, that uh, op to be open and to, to show that. Um, there are others with more experience that can help you also to innovate, to uh, make your things better by, by learning from others. We are Thank not you. just working within Latin America, but we are also open to Asia and, some, and to Europe we too, because we know we were more or less the last ones uh, <laughs> involved in the biogas <laughs> in the world. Thank you so much, Mariella. Thank you. I mean, I think that, that, that brings up so many important points that, that Willington is bringing out on the slide here. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I like especially your point about the, the honesty um, that's needed and, uh, and to learn from, from the, the bad lessons, uh, as he's written there. So I will just yeah. move on to, um, to Harihara Mahapatra next. Um, so let me bring you onto the line. Hi. Hi, Harihara. Are you there? Yes. Okay, wonderful. So a question that I have for you um, is that, especially about clean, now we haven't talked as much about financing. You brought it out in your presentation, um, but I understand that clean has been helping a lot of um, energy access SMEs in India access financing. Um, what's been the central challenge for them though, and how is this changing in your view? Well, as far as fi you know, access to finance for these entrepreneurs are concerned, the central challenge remains in the business model understanding. You know, the financiers field it are unable to understand how this business model would work. A uh, couple of things: one, uh, how it would scale up, uh, the, the scaling possibilities, uh, you know, the cash flow analysis, uh, possibility of uh, making profit, pay, you know, the ability of entrepreneurs to pay back. You know, their track record, financial strength. So these are some of the concerns that the bankers have got. And therefore, uh, there is a slight hesitant uh, feeling, slight, uh, you know, um, people, you know, bankers are not that comfortable lending to these entrepreneurs, especially when they are new and upcoming. And this is uh, even more uh, severe because of the fact that, you know, under the, under the policy environment, macro policy environment, 
uh, government is pushing for uh, the central grid approach and therefore bankers have even more concern that uh, there are lack of business model and uh, track record uh, and there is not such uh, facilitated policy environment and therefore they are hesitant uh, lending to these enterprises so these are some of the central uh, challenges that uh, these enterprises are facing right now uh, as an uh, association of uh, these enterprises uh, we have a mandate to facilitate these fund, uh, funds to flow to the our enterprises and uh, therefore some of those um, uh, initiatives that we have taken in uh, recent time is uh, first we wanted to understand what are the challenges perceived by the bankers and uh, we we undertook a debt study um, not only to understand the debt side but also to understand the equity and the grant side and and to and once the challenges are understood we we could devise the way forward so what uh, we are doing right now to make the paradigm shift uh, especially in the perception side is we have started uh, developing financial literacy courses for our uh, entrepreneurs at different uh, tiers uh, let's say tier 1 who are who are, who are very very primitive and uh, they have uh, they, they lack uh, understanding of how to write a proposal how to read a financial statement for them we have uh, developed a curriculum at a level 1 uh, uh, at level 1 we have uh, done an advanced course for uh, tier 2 entrepreneurs and we have done a very advanced course for tier 3 entrepreneurs and we are going to offer such kind of training to uh, our members in the in the time to come and we are also doing a lot of um, interfaces and linkages with uh, financiers and um, microfinance institutions and rrbs and we are doing a lot of meetings with our practitioners so that they understand each other um, to also add to this uh, initiative we have started this tool called uh, dre monitoring and evaluation tool called dream tool where Our, our members as well as the financiers can understand the state of the sec, you know enterprise in itself and find out the gaps uh, where they need to improve uh, so that some of the funds can actually flow to the flow to the so these are some of the work that we are trying to do so that uh, there is a change in the mindset of the bank Absolutely. That's brilliant. No, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, changing the mindset of the bankers. So that's kind of a chief problem for SMEs in India. Um brilliant. So what I'm going to do right now um is um very quickly do one last poll with you all um just to uh get a little bit of your views uh here towards the end of our time here. So let me just post this here. Um how could energy access networks have an even greater impact? um and in your opinion they should increase their focus on um policy regulation financing r&d such technology communities and social issues such as social research and capacity building and sorry we didn't have another option to put other but i know there are many other issues to include in there so let's hear some of your perspectives um if you guys want to vote here and we're very curious to hear what what you think So I give you a few seconds just bring everybody back in here and um and hear from our audience. Okay, so let me go ahead and close this poll and share that with you guys. Now there's still a few votes coming in. Okay. Vote, vote, vote. Okay, brilliant. I'm going to close the poll and share that with everybody now. All right. Um all right. So it looks like uh yeah, capacity building um seems to be the top the top point. Um but as well communities and social issues financing um coming in second r&d and technology and a little bit less on policy and regulation okay great now what i want to do last here um is a little bit of um a little lightning round with the panelists and i just want to hear from each of you um what your one goal for your networks would be this year and i ask you to please try to keep that within one sentence so we'll go in the same order um and we'll start with uh we'll start with Jim Hi Jim Sorry let me see so so sorry that's my fault <laughs> Okay Hi, Yeah hi. so what, <laughs> hi what what is the the one goal that um the energy access practitioners network would like to achieve in 2018 I think we will continue to refine um the different activities that we carry out to make sure that they're as practical and and needs 
kind of meeting the needs of our membership as a whole. I think we every year we we try to do that, and uh, what informs that is a number of different surveys that we conduct throughout the year, both kind of officially and unofficially. So. Uh, we're actually just analyzing the results of our recent survey and getting some interesting feedback from our members. So um, I don't think it's anything new, but I think uh, every year we remind ourselves that we need to make sure that what we're doing is, is practical, pr uh, actionable, um, and relevant to the needs of our members. And so that's kind of our biggest goal uh, for the year. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you for that. And that, that actually connects with, uh, with a couple of questions that we had from the audience. So um, just to let them know, we are seeing your questions um, and we, we may not have time to get around to all of them, but we're keeping those in mind. Um, so next up, um, Dipti Vigela, could you tell me uh, what is HPNet's uh, biggest goal for 2018? Yeah, so at the end of 2018, we will be five years old. And uh, in these years, we've done a good job of, um, of identifying key priorities, which have formed into working groups. And over the last year, we've developed a structure that helps us uh, continue to have impact even with more members and also include a board of advisors uh, that, have, that have been senior uh, persons that have informally been advising us. So together with the things that we've already done with the, the people and the relationships we have and this new structure, we really need to uh, mobilize resources. We've been working on a shoestring budget over the last few years and um, and now to, to really uh, take the network to a next phase, we, we have to support it better. Absolutely. Thank you, Dipti. So mobilize resources. Okay, so now we'll go to um, Mariela. I'd like to hear for Red Biolac, what is your um, primary goal for 2018? Hi, Molly again. Yeah, thank you. It's a very good question. Actually, for this year, I would say, um, since we are about to be 10 years working in the field, um, I would say we are pretty much a witness of a, of a decade of big challenges in the world um, where biogas contributes to big issues of, of it uh, in terms of environment. However, we don't want to just be a fashionable uh, technology or a fashionable uh, initiative. And so I think our big goal would be one, to pursue uh, good work and uh, to keep on attending the demands of our of our practitioners within um, the network, to help to to help uh, the professionals and practitioners working there to really develop and and get the the tools they they need uh, and we all together need to to address. Um, the, those demands, and this is pretty much linked, of course, to to translate what we have learned. So I would mention, secondly, to to move our activities towards policy making and advocacy uh, more and more. And we, we have to have that uh, sight on our horizon. And and I think then we would be complementing all our activities so far in a, in a very successful way. Absolutely. Thank you, Mariella. Okay, policy making and advocacy in 2018. Um, and next up, um, Harihara Mahapatra, um, could you tell me for 2018, what is CLEAN's primary goal? Well, we have got two, uh, one internal and one external. The internal uh, bit is uh, you know, to develop CLEAN's governance. Uh, Basically, CLEAN is still running as an independent project. Uh, we need to set up uh, CLEAN as a, as a legal entity. And within that, uh, you know, it has to constitute its own board and different working groups. And you know, if, uh, to, to set up the processes and systems within CLEAN so that there are member ownership and members' uh, you know, contribution um, to, to the decision making and the processes and plans. So, one is uh, governance system and you know, strategic review and long-term planning of clean uh, on one hand. And on the other hand, uh, um, you know, members have started uh, sharing that we need to be more proactive in policy advocacy. And therefore, uh, we, we foresee a role in uh, uh, stronger policy uh, engagement with the government and you know, developing some kind of a facilitating and conducive policy. So these are the two goals that clean foresee for this year. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. Thank you. Well, thank you for the, both the internal and the external perspective there. And, and again, policy and advocacy being being very big for you this year. Um, so before um, before we close, I want to go to uh, Willington from Visions. Hi, Willington. Are you there? I am here. Do you All hear right. No? Yeah. I hear okay. You. Thank you so much for, for sharing with us this kind of live notes, um, and I, I hope the audience has been enjoying your, your hard work of keeping up with the conversation. Um, so what I wanted to ask you um, here at the end, and, and since this is a Visions webinar, um, something I want to know about is actually I hear you're launching a new call for proposals focusing on exchanges. Can you tell us a little bit about this? I think some people in the audience might be interested. Yes, definitely. Um, well, uh, what, this is one of our our supporting tools, uh, which is the SEPS, and um, the call was launched on on Monday, and it it is open until twenty sixth of February, um, and we are waiting for proposals. Um, that aim at facilitating. Uh, interactions, uh, mobilization of knowledge between uh, practitioners or organizations and, and other stakeholders in order to advance the sector, let's say. So the, the, the call is focused on what we call exchanges or knowledge exchanges. And what can be a knowledge exchange is, is a rather very, is a, an open concept, let's say. The important is to have some impact on the capacities of the people and the organizations involved in, involved in these exchanges. So you can have some things like capacity buildings, trainings, or workshops um, for South-South mutual learning, or dialogues with policy makers, or other kind of types of, of activities bringing awareness and advocacy for for uh, sustainable energy so we are very uh very, we will very welcome interesting ideas and activities for for moving um exchanges in the in the global south we have uh the the call have all uh, um focus at regional focus which is the two big regions where we are cooperating uh, with practitioners, which is Latin America and the Caribbean, and the South and Southeast Asia region. That's the, the focus of this call. Yes. And Thank you so much. It, oh, uh, sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Just a last, a last point. Uh, this is also very related, and this webinar is also very related to one of our main goals this year, which is um, it, moving and facilitating more dialogue and more. Um, yeah, more transparent dialogue in the in the space about the challenges, the commonalities, but also the conflicts. Let's say the things that are underrepresented, and um, and this uh, idea of the of the call for proposals is also going in that in that goal of two thousand eight of putting more more efforts of visions in in facilitating dialogue, in facilitating uh, knowledge creation knowledge um, complementation, yeah. Absolutely, okay, so for 2018, uh, Wishens is, is, is putting its money where its mouth is, in other words, and, mm -hmm. uh, and opening a, a, a call. So I've, I've posted that here, the link to uh, wishens.net, W-I-S-I-O-N-S dot N-E-T. Um, it's there in your chat box and uh, audience, please go there um, if you're interested in that. So thank you so much, Willington. Um, so I'd just like to thank everyone for joining us here today. Um, and I'd like to ask um, the audience to, to please possibly fill in a survey. Let us know how your experience was today. We want to hear from you. We want to know if there were any technical problems. Um, if there were things that you really enjoyed about the webinar, if you have ideas for future webinar topics, please share those with us um, in the survey. Um, so let me just thank everyone. Perhaps we can, if I have you muted, I will take you off of mute and just say thank you um, very much for uh, joining us here today. It's been a real pleasure to hear your perspectives on energy access networks. So um, I will look forward to, uh, to a future webinar. So just thank you to all of our speakers today. Thank you. Thank you, Molly. Yeah.
Thank you. Thank you to you, Molly. Yeah, oh, thank, thank you, Molly. You. Oh, it's been brilliant. So wonderful. So audience, please stick around for the survey afterwards. And thank you for staying with us. Um, we hope you enjoyed it. And we'll look forward to welcoming you to our next webinar. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.